You're looking live at Launchpad 39A, where in just a few minutes, SpaceX will begin fueling its Falcon 9 rocket right there. At the top is a lunar lander built by Intuitive Machines with NASA payloads on board. Hello, and welcome everyone to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz. Liftoff of a Nova Sea moon lander is scheduled for 1.05 a.m. Eastern time after the team waved off a launch attempt yesterday. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes, but for today, we are go for launch. And if everything goes according to plan, that lander will complete its journey eight days from now with a landing at Malapert A, a 24 kilometer wide crater on the shadowy south side of the moon. Intuitive Machines, an American-based company in Houston, Texas, built and developed the lunar lander that will carry, among other things, six NASA payloads to the moon. We'll tell you all about those instruments and much more throughout this broadcast, but first, Let's learn a little more about the moonbound spacecraft. It's an autonomous Nova Sea class lunar lander named Odysseus. Including the solar panels, it is 4.3 meters tall. Including the landing gear, it is 4.6 meters wide. The lander weighs approximately 675 kilograms and is capable of delivering about 130 kilograms of payload to the surface of the moon. Most of that spacecraft weight is fuel. Odysseus uses a liquid methane and liquid oxygen main engine that can throttle down to perform its final descent to the lunar surface in one continuous burn. Now, Intuitive Machines' IM-1 mission is funded by NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, which allows acquisition of lunar delivery services from American companies for payloads that advance science, exploration, and the commercial development of the moon. Now, Odysseus's liquid methane had to be loaded shortly before launch, so SpaceX developed a new way to fuel the spacecraft while it was already attached to the rocket and on the pad. Joining me now live is Jesse Anderson at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. And Jesse, the team decided to postpone yesterday's launch attempt just before that, uh, that uh, methane loading was set to begin. Yes, that's correct, Megan, and thank you. As some of you may know, we stood down from yesterday's launch attempt due to an off-nominal methane temperature, due to off-nominal methane temperatures prior to stepping into methane load. Our teams have reviewed the data and started fueling preparations earlier today to allow the temperatures to better align to what we saw during our wet dress rehearsal earlier in the week. 
At two hours and about 20 minutes, methane fueling begin and completed just before our live coverage started. And we are now ready to give launch another shot this evening. SpaceX is excited to partner with NASA as part of the Com Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. And today we are thrilled to support the first US lunar landing since the Apollo program ended more than 50 years ago. This mission marks our 14th of the year and second in the last eight hours. Earlier this week, our team captured this photo of Falcon 9 and IM-1 with the moon just beyond. And this is such a great image with the vehicle's destination and its sights and a wonderful celebration of the Lunar New Year. 2024 is the year of the dragon, which is considered one of the luckiest animals in the Chinese zodiac. This is very fitting as our own Dragon spacecraft has completed 40 missions transporting crew and cargo to and from the International Space Station, including Axiom 3, which concluded earlier this month, and Crew 7, which is currently docked to the station. And with NASA's Crew 8 mission just around the corner, we are on track to launch 50 people to orbit across all of our missions since 2020. As many of you may know, SpaceX was founded with the goal of making life multiplanetary, and with today's mission, we get one step closer to that becoming a reality. To support our growing manifest, we've recently made some new upgrades to Space Launch Complex 40, which you can see there with a brand new crew arm. These updates, with these updates, we're on our way to having two launch pads capable of supporting human spaceflight missions. If you're interested in helping advance the future of human spaceflight, check out spacex.com slash human spaceflight to learn more. In addition to flying people, SpaceX also enables researchers the opportunity to fly critical science to orbit on our Dragon spacecraft, which has carried over a thousand research experiments to and from low Earth orbit and the International Space Station since 2012. Researchers can submit research proposals and explore current research opportunities at spacex.com slash human spaceflight slash research. Enabling research in space paves the way for us to explore beyond Earth and make life multiplanetary. And today's mission furthers that goal by providing insights into the lunar surface environment and the ability to test technologies to better enable Artemis astronauts to land safely on the moon. For now, let's get familiar with the rocket that you see there on your screen. Pull for propellant Falcon load is complete. Is we are go for propellant loading and launch. Some good call outs there. Good for propellant loading. Falcon 9 is a two-stage rocket and the first orbital class rocket capable of reflight. Since taking flight in 2010, our Falcon 9 rocket has made 297 flights and delivered all sorts of payloads to orbit. This is the 18th flight of the first stage booster supporting this mission. Falcon 9 is essentially two rockets in one. The first stage, which is the tallest portion of the vehicle, provides 1.7 million pounds of thrust thanks to its nine Merlin M1D engines. Named after the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars, the number nine refers to the nine Merlin engines that power Falcon 9's first stage. And you can see those on your screen. This is a photo of today's Falcon 9 getting ready to roll out to the pad earlier this week. These are the nine engines that will be responsible for doing the heavy lifting today and getting to orbital velocity. Though there are nine engines on the first stage, there are actually nine, uh, 10 engines on the vehicle as a whole. The second stage has a slightly modified engine on it. It's called the Merlin Vacuum, or what we call the MVAC engine. This engine has a larger nozzle, which allows the second stage to perform more efficiently in the vacuum of space. The first stage gets us out of Earth's atmosphere and into space, while the second stage takes the payload to its targeted drop-off orbit. The large barrel structure with the pointed nose at the very top of the rocket is the payload fairing, and it's composed of two halves made up of carbon composite material that come together to protect the payload until we're in the vacuum of space. And speaking of the payload, the Nova C lunar lander arrived at Kennedy Space Center in Florida back in December. Since then, teams have been integrating the spacecraft to Falcon 9's second stage in preparation for launch. And as Megan mentioned earlier during this mission, SpaceX proved out new procedures and hardware that enabled fuel, fueling of the IM-1 lander on the pad with cryogenic methane and oxygen starting about two and a half hours before launch. Uh, this is a first for SpaceX. 
SpaceX team's modified launch complex 39A's pad and transporter erector, installing a new liquid oxygen tank, methane tank, propellant lines, and two control skids on either side of the top of the transporter erector. From there, the new propellant lines pass through a new stage two quick disconnect that attaches to new plumbing and another set of quick disconnects leading to the IM-1 lander. Heat exchangers within the ground system densify the oxygen and methane as they flow from their storage tanks towards the lander. Falcon 9 this tanks are venting for the start of propellant load. This allows the cryogenics to remain below their respective boiling points during the countdown and eliminate the need to top off the propellant while Falcon 9 the is LD being loaded for launch. The LD briefing the abort instructions for non-urgent no-go conditions. Brief the CE or LD and they will approve aborting the count. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Just pausing for those comms there. Given the lack of methane used in the Falcon program, Falcon teams leaned on the expertise of Starship teams and are using methane sensors from Starship to verify the health and status of the lander and our fueling system. And so far it continues to be a smooth countdown and we're looking good for an on-time liftoff. In the meantime, let's check in with Josh Marshall at, over at Intuitive Machines. How's it going, Josh? That's ah, going well, Jesse, and thank you. And welcome into the broadcast booth at Intuitive Machines' Mission Operations Center in Houston, Texas. This room is just outside of what we call Nova Control. Nova being the control, being the nerve center of our entire lunar program. Right now, flight controllers are making their pre-flight checks and monitoring our lunar lander's fueling process on the pad. Take a live look into Nova Control. There are 12 console positions in a circular design. This unique shape wasn't a coincidence. We wanted to create a collaborative environment that folks can quickly communicate and make decisions. The design also pulled some inspiration from the Star Trek USS Enterprise Bridge. Starting now, we have three primary flight controller teams working around the clock to monitor, command, and control our lunar lander during its journey to the moon's South Pole region. Here's a closer look at how we'll get there. The Intuitive Machines IM-1 mission is sending commercial and NASA payloads to the Lunar South Pole region on an uncrewed robotic Nova C-class lunar lander called Odysseus. The lander is the tip of the iceberg, and what's below that is the full program that is on a miniature scale very similar to what the Apollo program had. The IM-1 flight path mirrors the historical achievements of Apollo too starting with separation for the launch vehicle on a direct shot at the moon. That trajectory is basically like throwing a fastball that is going to hit the moon six or seven days later like an outfielder stretching out to grab it. The first four days are dedicated to flight controllers in Houston firing the lander's 3D printed liquid methane and liquid oxygen engine to make small course adjustments to hit its orbit target around the moon. This particular coordinate system is called the B-plane. You can think about the B-plane kind of like the backboard of a basketball goal. And you basically know when you shoot hoops that if you can get the basketball in the square on that backboard, it's gonna go in. And the B-plane for astrodynamicists is very much the same thing. With the B-plane on target, Odysseus is prepped for a critical autonomous maneuver on the moon's far side. This critical burn maneuver is completed in the blind with the moon blocking direct communications back to Nova Control in Houston. Once we get around the moon, we have on the day side of the moon, the sun heating us from one side and reflected infrared light off the bright moon warming us on the other. Then we plunge into night and now we're cold on both sides. It's very tough. About an hour before landing, flight controllers command descent orbit insertion or DOI. This is a main engine firing to slow the spacecraft so its altitude drops from 100 kilometers to about 10 kilometers above the lunar surface. After DOI, Odysseus coasts for about an hour before starting its final approach. And then we reach a point called power descent initiation. The guidance system on board makes the decision to activate the main engine at very close to full power. Cameras and lasers are feeding information to the lander's navigation algorithms, which provide guidance, navigation, and control. 
With a safe site identified, Odysseus enters a three meter per second descent, then down to one meter per second for the last 10 meters to the lunar surface. Now, the lander is using an inertial measurement unit, which is similar to a human inner ear that senses rotation and acceleration. Flight controllers expect about a 15 second delay before confirming the ultimate milestone, softly landing on the surface of the moon. And I can tell you just from doing our simulations, that's the longest 15 seconds you'll ever experience as you wait for the final light to turn green to indicate that you've landed on the moon. And that overview of the IM-1 mission was provided by our co-founder and chief technology officer, Dr. Tim Crane, who's also the mission director on our blue team, which is scheduled for landing operations. Right now, former NASA astronaut and Intuitive Machines' is vice president of production and operations, Jack Fisher, is in the mission director's seat. His team is gearing up for launch from Kennedy Space Center, where Megan is standing by with more on NASA's role in the IM-1 mission. Megan. Thank you, Josh. So you've heard us mention CLIPS, or the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, but what is this new initiative? Well, NASA is teaming up with several American companies to deliver science and technology to the lunar surface. It will streamline the science in studying the moon, but also help us all understand the risks and rewards before human missions to the lunar surface and beyond. Our moon. It seems so close in the night sky. But getting there is really hard. But what if there was a way to change that? Only a few nations have successfully landed on the moon. As NASA sends astronauts back to the lunar surface, this time to stay, we will need to send science and technology instruments ahead of time to lay the foundation for human exploration. To make this happen, NASA is helping establish a commercial lunar economy. For the first time ever, there will be commercial delivery services to the moon. We are enabling American companies to send our payloads to the lunar surface for us. These delivery services will expand our capabilities for exploration, radically increasing the amount of science we can achieve. This high-risk, high-reward initiative will invest in and leverage the entrepreneurial spirit of American innovation to launch a commercial lunar marketplace advancing technology and exploration for all of us. With this never before seen streamlined access to the moon, we will be able to make novel measurements and develop technologies that scientists have long wanted to do on the lunar surface. And as this new industry matures, this commercial delivery service for NASA and other customers could expand beyond the moon to other destinations in our solar system and we can learn to live on another world because we are explorers. In 2019, NASA awarded Intuitive Machines its first of three mission task orders to deliver NASA science and technology to the moon. So over the following four years, Intuitive Machines has built an entire space program to support these CLIPS missions. The company completed its lunar lander in a new facility at the Houston Spaceport, just down the street from NASA's Johnson Space Center. Joining me on set now is Steve Altimus. He is the CEO of Intuitive Machines and former Deputy Director of Johnson Space Center. Good morning to you. Good morning, Megan. Let's take a look at this clock. You've been looking at it for quite a while now. So we are 28 minutes yes. from launch. How are you feeling? I'm ecstatic to be here. Uh, such a historic moment um, as we get ready to fire the Falcon 9 up and, and light the engines. All systems are go. The tanks uh, on the lander are loaded. And uh, we're just waiting for this uh, last uh, 28 minutes to uh, light the candle. So why did you start a company to commercially build and fly lunar landers? Well, we started a company just because, you know, at the time NASA was thinking about a capability-driven framework and no real destination. And so I decided to retire early and think about a business where I could apply human spaceflight uh, expertise in engineering and methodologies to uh, in solving intractable problems around the world in oil and gas and energy, medicine, and aerospace. Well, in 2018, uh, when the National Security Council came up with Strategic Directive 1, which was to say that the moon is now of strategic interest, we turned our whole company 
towards uh, attempting to land on the moon to return the United States to the moon for the first time in 52 years. So we've been talking about your lander, obviously, Nova C, and your fellow co-founder, Dr. Tim Crane, mentioned that your core group had worked on Project Morpheus, and we have some video to show folks right now. You know, I remember that experimental prototype uh, and the propulsion tests were completed right here at KSC. So how did Morpheus inform what you ended up doing with IM-1? Well, Morpheus uh, was a terrestrial test bed that was a, a liquid oxygen, liquid methane lander that actually we flew 37 times, and we learned about how to perform, how to ignite and to um, fly a liquid oxygen, liquid methane engine. Um, that core technology is the core technology of our Nova Sea lander. Mm -hmm. In addition, the autonomous landing and hazard avoidance technology on board Morpheus, while it was older technology, those algorithms are the same kinds of algorithms we use for our hazard detection and avoidance, which is what we do on the moon to land on a place as rocky and craggy as uh, the South Pole. And so we use that um, technology also, which is a derivative of what NASA produced, but we had in our know-how as we started the company. And so you're talking about landing. You know, there have been a number of attempts to land on the moon recently, you know, by companies and other uh, co uh, countries. Roughly half has succeeded, half have failed. So what has your company done to increase the chances of landing on the moon? Well, I think first and foremost, what you have to do is you have to be humble about it and you have to learn from and stand on the shoulders of all those who have gone before. So we looked really hard at every mission that has gone to the moon and we look for what um, mistakes or, or um, uh, things in their design that caused their errors and did those mistakes or did those design uh, deficiencies, are they in our lander? And so we learn from others and so we appreciate everyone who's tried to go before. But in addition, we bring things together quickly. We bring uh, hardware and software together in the early stages of development testing and test often. And we put them on multiple test beds and test, test, test like we fly. And that's the key to success and that's what I think we did. We learned from human spaceflight engineering to take the best of what we had and what we were doing and then streamline it to be agile and efficient. And we were working on a fixed price budget so it was essential that we innovated. And I think over constrained budget, over constrained schedule and an incredibly challenging uh, uh, thing like landing on the moon forced us to innovate, sure. and that's the key. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, and good luck tonight. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So once the Nova Sea lander gets to the moon, there are six instruments on board that will play a key role in navigating and studying the lunar surface. And the first one is this. It's a lightweight laser retro reflector array, or LRA. This passive uh, optical instrument is a collection of eight, as you can see here, about half-inch reflectors or mirrors used for measuring distance. So the plan is, after Nova Sea lands on the moon, future land or spacecraft flying near Nova C's lunar location can cast a laser towards the surface and these retro reflectors will bounce the light back to the approaching craft. That reflected laser light will help determine how close the spacecraft are to the lunar surface, ensuring a smoother landing. So really, it's similar to when you're reversing your car and watching a camera to let you know just how close you are to an object. All right, so uh, for more than, um, so let's go back now to Houston where Josh Marshall is standing by live at Intuitive Machines uh, with an update. And Josh, what is the latest? Thanks, Megan. And if you're just joining us at home, welcome to Nova Control in Houston, Texas. Right now, flight controllers are monitoring launch pad activity and staying in communication with SpaceX's launch control in Florida, where we have another team working side by side with SpaceX to monitor Nova Sea's fueling and launch readiness. After launch, flight controllers working each of Nova Control's 12 positions will prepare for first contact with our Nova Sea class lunar lander. That process won't start until a spring force gently pushes the lander away from the launch vehicle's second stage, which is scheduled for about 48 minutes after liftoff. After separation, our lander's orbit is called translunar orbit. This enables Nova Sea to reach lunar orbit in about a week, but requires a lunar lander with a very capable engine. Nova C was tailor-made for NASA's CLPS initiative and supporting commercial lunar exploration. It's a pillar of Intuitive Machines' lunar access services, and we took a deep dive into what makes Nova C qualified for this historic undertaking.
The Nova C was our version of a liquid oxygen, liquid methane lander, and we went about imagining that into existence. Intuitive Machines' Nova C class 3D printed engine took its first breath of liquid methane and liquid oxygen in 2018 on an airstrip at Ellington Airport in Houston, Texas. We didn't have enough money for a facility with blast walls and and a, a water suppression or water deluge. So we had a test outside in the, in the environment of Houston where the temperature is about 100 degrees and the humidity is like the same. And we are having an 18 hour day rolling out to the runway. It was brutal, uh, but we did it to get the critical test engine data we needed to build our own engine. Designed, manufactured, and controlled in space by Intuitive Machines, Nova C's structure is primarily carbon composite. We needed to build the lightest weight structure we could. That meant honeycomb aluminum core with composite face sheets, uh, composite struts, and most importantly, linerless composite propellant tank. Man, what a challenge that was. Between the engine, carbon composites, software, and electronics required to build a Nova C lunar lander, it took an incredible amount of touch labor to get to the launch pad. We worked very closely with San Jacinto Community College to create a uh, certification course for technicians where they would take these certifications. We then in Intuitive Machines would give them an internship and uh, test them out in the workplace. And anyone that showed the aptitude to be a really good technician, we hired on the spot. Nearly all of the lunar lander's payloads are mounted to its exterior, including six NASA-provided payloads that will help lay the foundation for Artemis missions. Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University's Eagle Cam, designed to deploy off Nova Sea right before landing to take third-person perspective images. The International Lunar Observatory Association's camera system mounted at exact angles that could capture images of the Milky Way from the lunar surface. A data center technology demonstration by Lone Star Data Holdings and Omni Heat Infinity, Columbia Sportswear's thermal reflective insulation used in many of their outdoor products will help protect Nova C from extreme temperatures in space. They've got brilliant ideas. And if we can help facilitate those startups to help build this economy, I think that raises all boats. And it's as, as serving as the transportation leg to the moon, we're happy to accommodate those kinds of companies. The IM-1 landing site is called Malapert A. It's named after 17th century Belgian astronomer Charles Malapert and is expectedly made of lunar highland material, similar to the material studied during Apollo 16, which was also launched from Launch Complex 39A, where we have more from Megan. All right, thanks, Josh. And actually, not far from the Malapert A landing site is the Malapert Massif region, and that is one of the 13 candidate regions being considered for the Artemis III landing. Okay, so a second NASA instrument on board the Nova Sea lander is NASA's Radio Frequency Mass Gauge, or RFMG. The instrument is essentially a fuel gauge to estimate the amount of propellant in spacecraft tanks in specifically a low gravity space environment. So during this mission, RFMG will estimate the amount of propellant in Nova Sea's tanks. Once proven, RFMG technology would demonstrate significantly more accurate measurements of a fuel tank's fill level without requiring a thrust to provide a force upon the fuel in order to measure it, as current technology does. For the first time in more than 50 years, astronauts, including the first woman and person of color, will travel to the moon as part of NASA's Artemis program. To get there, SpaceX and NASA teamed up to develop the human landing system. Here's a closer look at your Artemis Moon Minute. With Artemis III planning to return humans to the moon for the first time since 1972, NASA and its commercial partners continue to develop the systems needed to land crews safely on the lunar surface. SpaceX will provide and operate a moon lander for NASA's Artemis III mission called Starship Human Landing System, or HLS. During Artemis III, NASA's Space Launch System rocket will launch four astronauts aboard the Orion spacecraft for their multi-day journey to lunar orbit. The Starship HLS, powered by two variants of SpaceX's Raptor engines, will launch uncrewed on a super-heavy booster to lunar orbit to pick up the crew. 
Once on board the HLS, two crew members will head to the surface of the moon where they will live and work for about a week collecting samples and performing science experiments. Once they're done, they'll get back into Starship to the orbiting Orion and return to Earth. That's your Artemis Moon Minute. For more on SpaceX's Starship Human Landing System, let's go back to Jesse Anderson live at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Jesse. Great. Thank you, Megan. Down at Starbase, Texas, we're continuing to build, test, and fly Starship, the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed. A fully reusable Starship is capable of carrying up to 150 metric tons to orbit and up to 100 passengers. We completed two test flights last year, and 2024 is lining up to see even more Starships take flight. We're still in the testing phase, but major milestones like flying at a high cadence, full system reuse, and on-orbit refilling are key priorities. Refilling on orbit will enable the transport of up to 100 tons all the way to Mars. Down at Starbase, we're gearing up for flight three of Starship. We have a fully stacked vehicle on the pad for the first time since flight two in November of last year, ready to go through pre-launch testing to get ready started. to fly. We're also building a second Starbase launch tower to further increase Starship's flight opportunities. Also in testing, our engineers are proving out all systems necessary to make a trip to the moon possible, such as propulsion, life support, and even the elevator that you see here, which will take crew and cargo from the Starship hatch opening down to the lunar surface. In partnership with NASA, SpaceX's Starship Human Landing System, or HLS, will put the first Artemis astronauts on the moon. We are part of the global team, which includes intuitive machines, that will further exploration of the moon under the Artemis program. SpaceX will perform one uncrewed demonstration flight before the Artemis III mission, which will be the first human surface expedition since 1972. To that end, SpaceX has been hard at work getting Starship ready for its moon missions and ultimately Mars. There's so much to look forward to and it's just incredible that humans are finally going back to the moon and the efforts of SpaceX and intuitive machines get to play a vital role in that. For those of you who have just joined, we're just about 15 minutes from launch of the IM-1 mission. Let's check back in with Josh at Intuitive Machines. Josh? Thanks, Jesse. We're counting down the minutes to launch and looking forward to Intuitive Machines firing its Nova C-Class Lunar Lander's engine about a day after liftoff. Nova C uses an environmentally friendly mixture of liquid methane and liquid oxygen. It's a propulsion system with deep roots to NASA's Project Morpheus. Morpheus was a prototype lander engineers at NASA's Johnson Space Center used to integrate technologies for future spacecraft that could land on a variety of destinations in our solar system. The project integrated NASA's autonomous landing and hazard avoidance technology designed to enable a spacecraft to identify, descend, and a, find a safe landing site that is relatively flat and free of large boulders, rocks, and craters. In the video on your screen, you can see that signature blue fire synonymous with liquid methane and liquid oxygen engines. That's the same fuel used on Nova C. From December 2013 to December 2014, Morpheus completed 13 free flight tests at the north end of Kennedy's shuttle and landing facility. And joining me now is our co-founder and chief technology officer, Dr. Tim Crane. Tim, before starting Intuitive Machines with your fellow co-founders, Steve Altimus and Dr. Cam Gaffarian, you were working on other things at Johnson Space Center to include Project Morpheus. What can you tell me about Project Morpheus and, and how that foundings of technology led to us getting to the launch pad today with your company? Well, one thing I can tell you is I get chills watching that <laughs> footage because it, it takes me right back. But this is a journey that Clearly our prop technology was a big part of Morpheus we brought forward. Also the all hat, the autonomous landing, hazard avoidance task, a lot of our navigation, the way we do software, the way we test our systems, a and even the discipline about knowing when some technology needs to wait for a future date so we can get to flight. 
all of that came from the Morpheus experience. And, you know, just uh, about a year ago, you got to see those Project Morpheus tanks again, but this time they were in your facility and you were testing them with your company. What can you tell me about uh, speeding up innovation through NASA's Reimbursable Space Act Agreement? Well, NASA really is a national treasure in terms of knowledge and capability, and in some places, um, equipment. And we had a supply chain issue with some of our tanks, and we needed to get our test rig up and running. Mm -hmm. And we knew the Morpheus tanks were uh, in surplus and reached out to NASA, and they facilitated getting those tanks to us so that we could proceed with testing while our flight tanks were coming in. And real quick, while you have you, why liquid methane, why liquid oxygen? Well, in the near term, it's very easy to work with. It's environmentally friendly. It's non-toxic. Um, it's very robust to uh, changing conditions. Down the road, it's the exploration fuel of the solar system, and uh, we can make it on Mars for bringing spacecraft back mm -hmm. from there, so we don't have to take all the fuel with us. Well, Tim, I know you're burning back to get back into mission control, watching your team that you fostered throughout all these years and listening to that IM-1 mission loop. We do appreciate your time today, and thanks for stopping in. Thanks, Josh. NASA Instruments on the Nova Sea lander for this IM-1 mission is the Lunar Node 1 Navigation Demonstrator, also called LN-1. That's much simpler. It's similar to when you use GPS to get to a destination. Let's take a look at how it works uh, and what it will do to help support future surface and orbital operations. Lunar Node 1 is meant to be a demonstration of how we can use various navigation technologies to figure out where you are in and around the moon. I'm holding in my hands uh, the Lunar Node 1 mass simulator. Uh, we use this build uh, to test out our vibrational modes, put on a shake table, and also do fit checks uh, with the lander itself. Um, inside of our payload, we have multiple electronics boards that fit within this chassis that is a little bit about a half of you in size. Um, you can see our external connectors here where we have our data and power uh, to the lander itself. And within here, we have multiple boards that do the power regulation, our data control, our FPGAs, all those kind of electronics pieces are in here, as well as a small S-band radio that attaches up underneath this top radiator in order to distribute this heat and then to talk to the antenna, which mounts here. Uh, this is the same size and build as the flight payload. Um, it's just not covered in MLI or some of the other materials that you'll see um, on the flight build itself. Now, IM-1 is the second launch of a lunar lander under NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. The first CLIPS launch was with Pittsburgh-based Astrobotic. The mission was called Peregrine Mission 1. It successfully launched last month on a ULA rocket, but afterwards, Astrobotic reported a failure in its propulsion system, which prevented the spacecraft from landing on the moon. Ten days later, Peregrine burned up after re-entering Earth's atmosphere. An anomaly review board will release its findings to what happened once complete. Join me now to talk about NASA's CLIPS initiative and its benefits and risks is Sandra Connolly. She's a Deputy Associate Administrator for NASA Science. Good morning to you. Good morning, Megan. So talk to me about some of the key takeaways as NASA moves forward with commercial lunar vendors. Yeah, so, so the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program is super important to NASA. It really is transforming our method of doing business. It's leveraging industries, emerging capabilities of actually providing end-to-end -end service for us. So rather than us having to build our own, we can now procure it. And it's not only, we're not the only customer. Other, organiz other government organizations, industry, academia from around the world are all going to procure these services. Are and it, there is risk associated with it, though. So right. we recognize that as we're evolving this capability. Yeah, so I was just going to ask you that. I mean, because we know that there are risks. Spacecraft is go for launch. Risks. Spacecraft is go for launch. We just heard a call for that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what involvement does NASA have uh, when our commercial providers are assessing the risks? So what's really important about this, too, is recognizing that industry is in the lead in, in providing these services, so they're the decision makers. So ultimately, what will happen is, you know, as, as they're making their decisions, uh, we obviously bring great experience along with us, and we will stand shoulder to shoulder with them and support them uh, through uh, the legal process, through contracts and all, but we will bring to bear what we need to, to support them to make sure that this is successful. Sure. So it seems like, again, yes, we are we're fully committed to the CLIPS uh, initiative. So what is NASA sending to the moon on future CLIPS flights? So, again, super exciting time for NASA. You may or may not realize we have 40 manifested payloads on the CLIPS mission. So over the next few years, and that's just for the NASA payloads, right? right? So you've got industry and academia as well. But um, 
focusing on intuitive machines, which is our you know, purpose for being here tonight. We're super excited about uh, their efforts here. So um, they actually have another payload that's going to be launching later this year. They're going to be delivering the Prime 1 mm. um, drill and spectrometer, which is actually going to uh, support our in situ resource utilization and support a future um, uh, uh, human presence on the moon. Sandra, thank you so much. We're excited to see what CLIPS uh, can do for NASA and, and for humanity, really, with what we plan to do with uh, the Artemis program. Thank you. Thank and you so much. Go Falcon 9. That's right. And go IM-1. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so let's send it back to our friends at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California, as they walk us through the final moments of the countdown, and then I will see you guys after lunch. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. At T minus just under seven and a half minutes, all systems are currently a go for an on time liftoff. Next up, in just about a couple minutes, the structure next to the vehicle, known as the strong back, will begin to retract away from the vehicle. But while we wait for that, let's talk about what it takes to actually get to orbit. In order to get the rocket and payload into any orbit, the rocket not only has to go up really fast, but it also has to go sideways. Chill has started. As we ascend, as we ascend, we tilt the engines and that turns the rocket horizontally. To help demonstrate this concept, an image of a firing a firing cannon from a really high mountain is what you can see there on your screen. The cannonball will arc and then good old gravity will pull it back down to earth. As you increase the power, the cannonball will arc and land farther and farther away. Eventually, if you could continue to increase the power, the cannonball will end up in free fall around the earth. Basically, gravity is pulling down on the cannonball, but it's going so fast that Stage it never hits one, the ground. Stage one, RP1 load is complete. This this arc that constantly misses the Earth is called an orbit. Falcon 9 effect effectively does the same thing as the cannon in this example, and it provides enough power and horizontal velocity to the second stage carrying the spacecraft, enabling the spacecraft to be placed into orbit around the Earth. Now, you'll be able to see this today by watching the orientation of Falcon 9 after liftoff. The rocket will go straight up until about T plus 10 seconds, at which point we will begin that shift in orientation, gimbling the engines so that Falcon 9 can go horizontally really fast. So be sure to look out for that after liftoff. Now again, at T minus five minutes and 38 seconds, all systems are currently go for liftoff. The strong back is going to begin retracting away shortly in preparation for that retraction. The clamp arms, which are located just around the second stage, just below the fairing, will begin to open. Once those are fully open, then the TE or the strong back can begin to recline away from Falcon 9. And you can see that on your screen, uh, those clamp arms just below the fairing there. Now the vehicle is nearly fully loaded with propellants and we did hear a call out that stage one prop loading um, has concluded. Nine, tanks we are, are still pressing loading for back retract. And there's that call out that we are beginning that process for that strong back retraction. Uh, propellant loading is continuing on the vehicle and will complete at T minus two minutes. The range is currently green and ready to, to support liftoff. And if for some reason we do not launch today, we do have a backup opportunity on Friday, February 16th at 1.12 a.m. Eastern Time. Strong back retract in progress. And good call outs there. The strong back retraction is now in progress and it will be slow and slight, but we should see those clamp arms begin to open up there. And there you can see it on your screen. Those clamp arms are now opening up. Again, once they are fully open, that will allow the transporter erector, that structure next to the vehicle, to begin to retract away. You should see that TE begin to move away very slow and slight. But at this point in the countdown, both the first and second stages are nearly fully loaded with 1 million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. And there you can see on your screen that TE is now moving away from Falcon 9. 
Falcon 9 uses two propellants, a refined form of kerosene called RP-1 or rocket propellant 1 as a fuel, and LOX or liquid oxygen as an oxidizer. Now, fire generally needs three elements to ignite. That's heat, fuel, and an oxidizing agent, which is usually oxygen. This is what's known as the fire triangle. In our case, the liquid oxygen is chilled below its boiling stage point so that it has a much, greater, a much greater amount of mass per volume, allowing us to load more of it into the vehicle. And in addition to these two propellants, we also use the chemical TTAB or triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane as an ignition source. The combustion of RP-1 and liquid oxygen is what makes the rocket go, but it's the TTAB that sets the match to the propellant mix. And we did hear a call out that stage one liquid oxygen loading is complete. Coming up next, uh, in the next couple of minutes at T minus 60 seconds, Falcon 9 will go into startup. That means that the rocket's autonomous flight computers will have taken over the launch countdown. And at just inside T minus two seconds, we will light those Merlin 1D engines for liftoff. The intuitive machine's payload continues to be healthy and the Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues on the vehicle. We are currently green for weather and the range is ready to support a T0 of 1.05 a.m. Eastern time. And just waiting for the Stage call out two, for lock liquid is complete. oxygen. Right on time. Stage two liquid oxygen loading is now complete. That concludes propellant loading on the vehicle. That means that Falcon 9 is fully loaded with 1 million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. Weather is 90% chance of Ground gas close out. good weather. Good weather for T0. And we are just about 30 seconds away from Falcon 9 going into startup. Now that propellant loading is complete, we are beginning to vent out the lines the propellant lines on that transporter rector there, so you can see more of those white clouds around the vehicle. Startup is coming up here in a couple seconds. Falcon 9 is in startup. Great call out. That means that the internal flight computers have now taken over the launch countdown. We are now just waiting the final go from the launch director. LD, go for launch. An excellent call. All systems are go for launch of Falcon 9 with the Intuitive Machines Lunar Payload. 30 seconds. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition, and liftoff. Go SpaceX, go IM-1, and the Odysseus Lunar Lander. Vehicle pitching down range. Stage 1 propulsion is nominal. Space Center carrying the IM-1 payload. Now during ascent, we tilt the engines, the technical no, term no, being no, gimbling, and that turns the rocket horizontally. And we're Mach 1. Max Q. And back shell has started. Yep. We have a few events coming up in quick su succession here. That will be Miko, stage separation, SES-1, and then the boost back burn startup 
on the first stage vehicle. Miko or main engine cutoff is where we shut down all nine of those M1D engines on the first stage vehicle that helps slow the vehicle down in preparation for stage separation, which is where the first and second stage will separate. And the first stage booster will begin its trip back to earth. And the second stage vehicle will uh, ignite that MVEC engine with SES-1 or second stage engine startup one. And then the boost back burn will begin on the first stage vehicle, which is one of three burns that's required for the vehicle to make its way back to today's landing zone. And this burn assists with the vehicle to reorient itself off. back towards land. Stage separation confirmed. And back ignition. Stage will have boost back startup. And there we saw and heard those call outs for Miko, stage separation, SES-1, and the boost back burn startup on the first stage. Some great views there. Now the first stage is currently performing its boost back burn. This is where we ignite a few of the engines to bring the trajectory towards, towards the landing site. And coming up here shortly will be fairing separation. Bearing separation confirmed. And an excellent view of fairing separation and an amazing view of the IM-1 payload attached to Falcon 9 second stage. Stage fairing deployment has been confirmed and we will be attempting to retrieve these fairing halves once they fall back to earth with our recovery vessel, Bob. Both vehicles are on nominal trajectories. And some good call outs there. And in about three minutes, there will be a couple more burns on our first stage to prepare for landing at landing zone one at Cape Canaveral. Again, we've completed the boost back burn on the first stage. That's the first burn of three. The next burns coming up will be the entry burn and then the landing burn for the first stage vehicle. Now we are at T plus four minutes and 17 seconds into today's mission. IM-1 is SpaceX's 14th launch this year and the lunar lander on board could be the first U.S. moon landing since the Apollo program ended more than 50 years ago. You can see on your screen that the MVEC engine on the second stage is ignited and we are currently in the first of two planned MVEC burns. Around T plus six minutes, you should see on your screen the first stage's entry burn coming up on that first stage vehicle. Again, that is the second of three burns. For the entry burn, we will relight three of those M1D engines, starting with the center E9 engine, followed shortly afterwards with the E1 and E5 engines. This helps slow the vehicle down as it enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. Now we need to slow down the vehicle to reduce re-entry forces, and that helps us to recover and reuse the first stage. And again, what you're seeing on your screen is a view of the MVAC engine on the second stage. And you can follow the speed and altitude of both vehicles on the bottom left hand of your screen that is showing the stage one telemetry and stage two telemetry on your right hand screen. And we are coming up on the entry burn for the first stage vehicle in just about 20 seconds or so. And what you're seeing on your screen on the left hand side, it's a little dark there, but that is a view from the first stage. And with the entry burn, we should see that screen light up with the engines reignited. Stage one, start up. And there you can see that the entry burn has begun with those engines relit. Stage one, FTS down. Stage one, FTS down. And a very 
Very quick. Both entry vehicles burn are on nominal there. trajectories. Great call outs, both vehicles on nominal trajectories. And as I mentioned, that was the second of three burns required for this booster to return back down to land. The next and final burn will be the landing burn. That's just a center E9 engine burn. And that helps slow the vehicle down just in time for landing. That's coming up in just about 15 seconds or so. Stage one transonic. Stage one left burn. And there Stage you can see on your left hand screen the, the landing Stage burn has begun. Let's system. watch as Falcon 9. Stage let's watch as Falcon 9 board. touches down for landing. Stage and a great one, view burn. there. That, that is comp We just had confirmation. Nominal of orbit landing. insertion. We also heard and just heard Seco 1 as well as a confirmation of good orbit for our Falcon 9 second stage carrying our IM-1 payload. Now with that landing, that marks SpaceX's 273rd recovery of an orbital class rocket including first stage landings for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. And with confirmation of good orbit, the mission isn't over yet. Coming up, we do have the second burn of our MVAC engine, or SES-2, on board the second stage around the T plus 41 minute mark, followed by spacecraft separation. So until then, we're gonna send it over to Megan at KSC. Megan? Thank you, Jesse. And if you're just joining us, welcome to the Space Coast of Florida, where we just witnessed live the liftoff of the moon-bound spacecraft and Nova Sea lander called Odysseus. And, you know, we see a lot of launches here uh, from Kennedy Space Center, but it really, truly never gets old. So Odysseus launched on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from launch pad 39A here at Kennedy Space Center. Intuitive Machines, an American, -based, uh, American company based in Houston, Texas, developed and built the lunar lander that is carrying, among other things, six NASA payloads. And if everything goes as planned, in eight days, that Nova Sea lander is expected to land on the shadowy south side of the moon. Make sure you stay with us. Our broadcast here on NASA TV will continue through Odysseus's acquisition of Signal, which is expected to happen around 1.55 a.m. Eastern Time. Now, before launch, we highlighted three of six NASA payloads on board the Nova Sea lander. The fourth is the SCALPS payload, which stands for Stereo Cameras for Lunar Plume Surface Studies. It includes four cameras at the base of the lunar lander. The images it captures will help scientists understand how landings impact the lunar surface for, for this mission and future ones. SCALPS is an array of small cameras that will be placed around the base of a lunar lander and collect imagery during the descent and landing of the vehicle. Using a technique called stereophotogrammetry, we can use those images to reconstruct a 3D shape of the ground. As the lander comes down, its hot engine plumes will interact with the surface. Our cameras will begin acquiring images from before this interaction begins until after the vehicle has landed on the surface. The SCALPS cameras will specifically be looking at the overall crater formation and erosion of the ground due to the rocket plumes. The final stereo images, which will be stored on a small onboard data storage unit, will be transferred to the lander and then downlinked to Earth, where we can use them to reconstruct the overall erosion volume and shape of the ground. With the Artemis program, we plan to establish a sustained lunar exploration and try to land multiple payloads in close proximity to one another. SCALPS data will be a critical part of understanding these phenomena and improving our computational models to inform these future landings. Let's head back now to Houston, where Josh Marshall is standing by live at Intuitive Machines headquarters with an update, and I'm, I'm sure very excited as well, Josh. 
<laughs> Thanks, Megan. With each passing minute, we are closer to receiving the lander's data in Nova Control. Right now, flight controllers are standing by for launch vehicle separation, followed by acquisition of signal. That's when the lander makes first communications contact, sending critical health and flight data into Nova Control. And we want to bring you closer to our Mission Operations Center to experience a few types of information that flight controllers are looking at during the mission. This particular screen is called the Deorbit Descent and Landing, or DDL, screen. This screen is primarily used by the mission director and landing system experts. It's used primarily while Nova C orbits the moon and through landing. The top right images of the moon are called the lunar tactical view. When the dots turn red, the lander is on the far side of the moon, and green is on the near side. The line is the tail where Nova C is, with each dot representing 10 minutes of elapsed time. The acceleration sensor portion of the screen shows raw acceleration values from Novacy's inertial measurement unit. This is used a lot during burn maneuvers and is a more robust way of measuring acceleration over time with the ability to look back at what has happened. For some reason, flight controllers have lost data. Finally, the column on the right is a received, accepted, edited, and failed pre-checked, or RAFE chart for short. When each of these lines are on top of each other, that's a good indication that Nova C's navigation system is in good health. That's because every measurement Nova C makes must be received, accepted, edited, or failed pre-check. The failure is a possible outlier of data that the lander's computer automatically knows is bad information. Collectively, the DDL screen is one of many data displays that flight controllers are monitoring to successfully navigate Nova C to the lunar surface. It's no small feat, and the tireless effort of our entire Intuitive Machines team has brought us to this moment, standing by for launch vehicle separation and acquisition of signal in approximately 40 minutes. Until then, we'll toss back to Megan with more on the challenges that lie ahead of the IM-1 mission. Yeah, we've been honest about it. You know how difficult it is to get to the moon. We haven't done it in more than 50 years, but the CLIPS initiative is going to change that. NASA and American companies who have teamed up to explore the moon know a lot of research needs to happen before astronauts head back to the lunar surface. In the end, the rewards outweigh the risks. Landing on the moon is hard. We're going back. Under this Artemis program, we're going to be sending humans to the moon for the first time since Apollo. So ahead of humans, we want to get up as much science exploration and technology experiments as possible. So CLIPS starts facilitating a lot of the early science, the things we want to learn before we even send humans. CLIPS stands for Commercial Lunar Payload Services, CLPS. The services part is the key element. Ordinarily, when NASA delivers a payload to the surface of the moon, they do it with a commercial partner, but NASA controls the building of the vehicle. Now, we're buying the service of delivery of our lunar payloads to the surface of the moon. It is a delivery service, akin to a delivery service that you'd have here on Earth. NASA will provide payloads to a commercial company. They decide how to get it to the moon. They have to develop their own lander, but they also have to manage the entire end-to-end -end mission. It's meant to provide affordable, rapid, frequent access to the lunar surface through American companies. We're funding different companies. We have commercial companies that are competing to win task orders to deliver our payloads to the surface of the moon. One of the goals when we started CLIPS was to help establish a lunar economy. Somebody has to do it first, and then it becomes commercially available. Then they're able to crank them up. Then they're able to make it more affordable. And so the lunar surface is just the next frontier for a commercial environment. But we had to acknowledge up front, all the way through the highest levels of the agent's leadership, that some of them will fail. These missions may not be as successful as a traditional NASA mission. We have accepted the risk that going through this innovative approach with these commercial companies, that there could be some failures. Some of them are new companies. None of them have ever successfully landed on the surface of the moon. So they're going to learn lessons. We need to give our vendors the opportunity to learn. And so that'll help ultimately buy down our risk as these companies learn, okay, what does it take to actually build up the lunar lander, integrate payloads, get to the lunar surface and land safely? They've been able to demonstrate that they have very, very good technical depth and the ability to design and execute missions. We're willing to take more shots on goal. We aren't risking human lives. And in the big picture, if we're flying missions at one-tenth of the cost of a NASA mission and we fail two of them, we still get eight missions for that same price. Even with 
one or two or three failures. This is still a very economical proposition. It's a risk posture which is more risk tolerant than NASA is accustomed to. There's not a single one of these companies that's willing to bet their mission on a coin toss. Every one of them is doing what they can in order to have the most successful mission possible. But the important thing to realize is that risk tolerant does not mean risky. And the rewards are a long-term ability to get payloads to the moon inexpensively, frequently, and rapidly. We want science, so we can then put more of our resources on even more science exploration and technology payloads and get more of a return on investment when we get to the moon. CLIPS provides tremendous benefit across the scientific and economic communities. So there's a lot we'd like to learn about the moon to help human habitation and prepare us for missions to Mars and beyond. So the moon is the first step. Flying on commercial missions will mean cost savings for NASA. To talk more about that, we have Joel Kearns here now. He's the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration in NASA's Science Mission Directorate. It's a very good morning, Joel. We just saw lunch. Oh, beautiful lunch. Fantastic. It's great to be back here, Megan. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, how does NASA maintain oversight when it comes to this, the, the CLIPS vendors? Obviously, this is a new initiative for us. Yeah. Well, remember, what we're doing here is NASA is not doing these missions. We're actually buying passage on commercial companies' missions for our experiments and our cargo. So we have established this group of pre-certified 14 U.S. companies that we can go to and have them bid to do a specific mission for us to land at a certain place of the, of the moon and to bring our cargo or our experiments with it. Once we actually select a company to do that, we assign them a NASA engineer who's their liaison. They represent all the NASA cargo and payloads to the company, and they represent the company back to NASA. As part of that, we get a lot of insight into how the company is actually going to do their mission. We try to make sure they really understand what they need to do to make our cargo successful, our data come back from the moon. And then we continuously learn from that, and we feed back and make sure that all 14 of those companies are certified to be able to do this work. So a very collaborative effort. Um, and you know, we're talking a lot about a commercial lunar economy. That's kind of the end goal. So mm -hmm. how does that shape up with CLIPS? How do we get there? A couple of different aspects. You know, when you hear us talk about wanting to form a lunar or a cislunar economy, in the short term, what that really means is, is encouraging the companies to get other non-NASA uh, organizations to pay them to bring their experiments or their cargo in the moon. But it's actually a lot broader than that. Just by offering these contracts to industry and having them build their own missions that we can take a part of, the companies are developing their own, you would think of as a parts and high-tech ecosphere on Earth that's part of the lunar economy. Uh, over the years, they've had to figure out ways to build these robotic landers, in some cases, um, helping other companies do new advanced high-tech components like rocket engines or fuel tanks or sensors, which didn't even exist five or six years ago. Mm. Of course, we can say now we're talking about small payloads going to the moon from commercials or having suppliers on Earth, but what the goal is in the long term is for these CLIPS companies to be able to take to the moon work or goods or services of other bigger companies that just want to do work in space. So what would you say is the agency's confidence in CLIPS? You know, you, you laid out a very ambitious uh, um, uh, vision. Yeah. Well, we think that the benefits of having this be successful where we go out to companies, and in effect we pay for a service to get our things to the moon, it's just so positive that we really are committed to exercising this model and seeing how American business does. Now, NASA is a learning organization, so every attempt that the companies make, we're always looking at. We're trying to learn from that and figure out how we're going to adjust things to go forward to do next. But we're really committed to this public-private partnership and service model that we've embarked on. Joel, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay, so the fifth uh, NASA technology we want to dive deeper into is called ROLSIS, which stands for Radio Wave Observations at the Lunar Surface of the Photoelectron Sheet. There's going to be a quiz on that later, so I hope you all took that down. Uh, ROLSIS will use four antennas and a low-frequency radio receiver system to determine how nearby radio emissions from the Sun, Earth, and other planets could interact or interfere with science conducted on the Moon. This experiment is something that has never been done before. It will perform many tests, including detecting solar radio bursts, radio emissions from Jupiter, and dust impacting the surface of the moon. Rolsis could even serve as a baseline for a future radio observatory on the lunar surface. Let's get another update from Josh Marshall, who's standing by live at Intuitive Machines headquarters in Houston. Josh. 
Hey, Megan, when I asked our mission directors about what should I expect from launch vehicle separation on until about AOS, and they said, well, we're just going to be patiently waiting. And after four years of hard work to get to this point, this must feel like an eternity. Let's take a live look into Nova Control. For some of the folks working today's launch and acquisition of Signal Shift, they've been working on the IM-1 mission since before we were awarded the task order back in 2019. Even folks that started in the past couple years or the past few months have poured their hearts and minds into this I Have One mission. In fact, every Thursday, Intuitive Machines holds a lunch and learn for folks uh, to learn more about the company. And just a few days ago, one of our flight controllers, Brooklyn Herman, was describing today's events and said the opportunity to land on the moon has been a dream for her whole life. And everyone at Intuitive Machines is part of this beautiful mission, an incredible opportunity. And while we do have a moment just in between launch vehicle separation, we want folks at home to know that that same sentiment echoes through everyone at Intuitive Machines. We are humbled by the gravity of our mission, yet emboldened by the boundless possibilities that lie ahead, starting with acquisition of Signal, which we expect to happen just a few minutes after launch vehicle separation. For now, our team will continue to patiently wait and toss it back to Florida to introduce another IM-1 mission payload. Megan. Well said, Josh. Okay, so the sixth and final payload has three telescopes that will help the spacecraft land safely. In the past, astronauts had to use a viewfinder or rely on radar. So the Artemis program has taken NASA back to the moon, and everything that goes there, including the instruments and people, must be flown there safely and landed there precisely. So the landing phase of that task is one of the most critical aspects of it. NDL is a lot of instrument that is used to enable that capability. It uses light in the same way that sonar uses sound. For NDL, we have three telescopes where light would come out of the telescope, hit the moon's surface, and some of that light will be reflected back. These telescopes are mounted on the outside of a vehicle so you get a clear view of the ground as it's coming in for a landing. In the Apollo era, large radars or astronauts using their eyes looking out of a viewport were used to help land the vehicles. NDL is going to have to take the burden off of the crew with a much smaller, lower power, and more accurate instrument. Throughout the broadcast, we showed you each of the six NASA instruments that are bound for the moon. To talk more about those is NASA project scientist Deborah Needham. Good morning to you. Good morning. Beautiful launch. A beautiful launch. <laughs> so exciting. So now we have six payloads bound for the moon. Um, you know, is there a common theme among them? I would say there are two themes to the payloads on board uh, Intuitive Machines, the Odysseus Lander. The first is demonstrating technologies for enabling future spacecraft to land more safely and more precisely on the lunar surface. And the second is uh, characterizing the surface of the lunar uh, south polar region, which is an extremely challenging environment to operate in, and it's preparing us for sending humans uh, to the lunar surface in advance of the Artemis missions. Mm -hmm. So so very precise things they're being sent for to study. So, uh, you know, if they make it to the moon in eight days, what happens next for each of them? So um, even the, the payload's work starts even before they get to the moon. Mm. Intuitive machines, while it's transiting towards the moon, will turn on the NASA payloads to make sure that they uh, survive launch and are operating uh, as we expect. And then you've heard about the RFMG, the radio frequency mass gauge. It will be operating the entire time all the way to the moon and down to the surface to make sure that it's monitoring propellants and collecting the data um, that it needs to uh, achieve its missions. And then during descent, you heard about NDL, the navigation software LIDAR and SCALPS, um, they're going to be operating during descent and collecting their data. And then once on the moon, uh, intuitive machines will turn on our other NASA payloads and they'll take turns collecting data until they achieve their missions. How are these instruments selected? Early on in the CLPS initiative, NASA turned to our scientists at the NASA centers to identify uh, science payloads and technologies that were relatively mature in their designs. Um, we did that because we wanted the payloads to be ready for when the landers were ready to integrate them onto the landers and deliver them to the moon. Um, so then NASA turned to the vendors and said, okay, you pick from this pre-selected list of NASA payloads which ones you think you can successfully uh, integrate onto your landers and deliver to the moon. So mm -hmm. Intuitive Machines actually chose the uh, payloads that are on its delivery. Deb, thank you so much. I can't wait to see what we discover with these payloads. Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, so now we're going to step aside while we await our next big milestone, the second burn of the second stage of the Falcon 9 rocket, and then right after that, the separation of Intuitive Machines' lunar lander from that second stage. We are expecting that to happen about 20 minutes from now, so we will see you then.
And welcome back to Kennedy Space Center, where we are currently awaiting the second burn of the Falcon 9 second stage and separation of Intuitive Machines' lander. This comes after a successful liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket with the Nova Sea lander called Odysseus at 1.05 a.m. Eastern Time. Intuitive Machines, an American company based in Houston, Texas, developed and built the lunar lander that is carrying, among other things, six NASA instruments. And if everything goes as planned, in eight days, mark your calendars, February 22nd, that Nova Sea lander is expected to land on the south side of the moon. Let's go now to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, where Jesse Anderson is live as we await that second burn and then spacecraft separation, Jesse. Great. Thanks, Megan. Now we are about a minute and a half away from that second burn of that MVAC engine. Next coming up will be SES-2, that second stage engine start two, and that will be followed by SECO-2, which is second stage engine cutoff. This burn will last about 53 seconds and will help the vehicle to make it to its final targeted drop-off orbit. Then the vehicle will coast for a few minutes uh, prior to spacecraft separation. So we are getting very close and this is getting very exciting here. Again, we're just about a minute away, just under a minute away from that last burn of this MVAC engine here. Now, right now, what you're seeing on your screen is an excellent view from the second stage looking at our MVAC engine with the amazing view of Earth in the background there. The IM-1 lunar lander is still currently attached to Falcon 9's second stage at this moment. And again, SES-2 and SECO-2 are coming up here in just about 15 seconds or so. And hoping to be able to continue these live views here so that we can see SES-1 and SECO-2. And there you can see we have just had SES-1. You can see that MVAC engine has now relit. Again, this is just about a 53 second burn, so just under a minute. And shutdown of this MVAC engine coming up here in just about 10 seconds or so. And there you can see nominal orbit of first one. MVAC engine. The MVAC engine has shut down, and we did hear that call out for a confirmation of good orbit. So, with confirmation of a good orbit, it looks like we are on track for spacecraft separation in just a few minutes from now, just about a little over five minutes. Now, it's been a great launch so far. SpaceX did begin fueling of the IM-1 lander on the pad about two and a half, about two hours and 20 minutes before liftoff. And we did talk about that a little bit earlier in the webcast. It's a totally new procedure and new hardware for SpaceX that enabled fueling of the IM-1 lander on the pad with cryogenic methane and oxygen. Now to be able to do that, SpaceX team's modified launch complex 39A's pad and transport director, installing a new liquid oxygen tank, a methane tank, propellant lines, and two control skids on the transporter erector. Then from there, the new propellant lines pass through a new stage two quick disconnect that attaches to new plumbing and another set of quick disconnects that lead to the IM-1 lander. 
And given the lack of methane used on the Falcon program, Falcon teams actually leaned on the expertise of Starship teams and used methane sensors from Starship to verify the health and status of the lander for our fueling system. Now, if you're just now joining us, we are just about four minutes away. We're waiting spacecraft separation of the IM-1 lunar lander, which is still currently attached to Falcon 9's second stage. And we did just a couple of minutes ago had a good last and final burn of our MVAC engine. That was SES-2 and SECO-2. And now the vehicle is continuing to coast with the spacecraft attached until it reaches the correct targeted drop-off orbit. And just to recap, if you're just now joining us, we did have an on-time liftoff at 1.05 a.m. Eastern Time, and everything has been proceeding nominally. Stage separation occurred just about two and a half minutes into flight. And that was followed by the successful landing of our Falcon 9's first stage back at landing zone one or LZ1. And that was the 18th landing for this specific booster. Now, for those of you following along, this booster has supported GPS-3, Mission-3, TurkSat 5A, Transporter-2, Intelsat G33 and G34, Transporter-6, and 12 Starlink missions. So pretty impressive and veteran booster for today's mission. At about T plus seven minutes and 46 uh, seconds, we did have a successful second engine cutoff or SECO-1. Uh, that was the first burn of the two burns for this mission that was followed by confirmation of good orbital insertion. The vehicle was then able to coast uh, for uh, for a bit there, and then again, just a few minutes ago, we did have the second burn for this MVAC engine. Two burns required to reach the targeted drop-off orbit for this IM-1 lander. And now the vehicle is coasting with payload attached, and we are just a couple of minutes away from spacecraft separation. IM-1 could become the first U.S. lunar lander since Apollo's last landing in 1972, almost 50 years ago, and could be the first commercial lander to succeed in reaching the moon's surface. Again, we are just about a minute and a half, just under a minute and a half away from spacecraft separation. And on your screen, as we wait to, to get some live views, you can see on your bottom right-hand screen the speed and the altitude uh, of the Stage 2 vehicle, again, still carrying the IM-1 spacecraft. And there's that live view there. Again, this is a view from the second stage vehicle looking aft at our MVAC engine there. And we are patiently waiting spacecraft separation here just under a minute from now. And now that we have this live perfect timing, we've got this great live view of the IM-1 lander right before it begins its eight-day journey to the moon. This is such an incredible view and very exciting that we have spacecraft separation coming up here in just a few seconds. I am one Odysseus lunar lander separation confirmed. What an incredible sight to see the IM-1 Nova C lunar lander drifting away from Falcon 9's second stage, confirming spacecraft separation. From all of us here at SpaceX, we are wishing the IM-1 lander a great flight and safe travels. 
SpaceX is honored to be a part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services initiative to deliver science and technology to the lunar surface, and we thank NASA and Intuitive Machines for entrusting us with today's historic mission to the moon. For those of you following along, you'll know that this mission marks our 14th of the year and second just today. Congrats to the SpaceX team. We're just in February and we've already launched in partnership with NASA missions like A Axiom 3, Cygnus, and PACE. And we're gearing up for the Crew 8 mission before the end of the month. Check out spacex.com slash launches for up-to-date missions and schedules. And before we sign off, let's go back to Josh at Intuitive Machines. Josh? What an incredible, incredible view. Just a few moments ago, our flight controllers inside of Nova Control heard that confirmation of launch vehicle separation. This starts the countdown toward our lunar lander's autonomous commissioning. During this milestone, the lander is going through the steps required to power on, determine its position relative to the sun, and make communications contact with flight controllers in Nova Control. It's an autonomous process that takes several minutes. In that time, we'll walk you through what's happening in space approximately two 223 kilometers or 139 miles from Earth. At launch vehicle separation, a spring force gently pushes Nova Sea away from the launch vehicle second stage. We just saw that, allowing the lander to deploy and drift away toward the moon. Brake wires connected to the launch vehicle let the lander know it has deployed, and Nova Sea starts an internal timer to count down to when it's safe to turn on. After the timer finishes, Nova Sea's primary systems are expected to autonomously power on. This includes guidance, navigation, and control, or GNC for short, automated flight management software, radios, sensors, and thermal control. The GNC system powers on the cold gas helium reaction control system to stabilize the vehicle's attitude, because at this point, the lander does not know where it's pointed, but it can stop any residual spin motion. This is much like a person spinning in a chair with closed eyes can stop spinning without knowing which way they're pointing when they stop. After controlling the spin rate, special cameras known as star trackers autonomously match images of the distant star field and provide Nova C with its orientation. Software then takes those star tracker measurements and processes them through an algorithm known as the Kalman filter to correct the onboard orientation. The lander now has two critical data points, its attitude relative to the star field and a reference position from the estimated launch vector. With these data points, Nova C may command its reaction control system to maneuver the lander's top deck solar array toward the sun for illumination, generating maximum power. All of these steps are expected to be happening right now, and when autonomous commissioning is complete, our Nova Sea lander named Odysseus turns on its communication radios and makes first communications contact known as acquisition of signal, or AOS. Making that communications connection involves more than the lander's operations in space. It takes careful coordination here on Earth, too, using Intuitive Machines as a lunar data network. The network was designed to support NASA's CLIPS initiative, government services, and other commercial efforts efforts using line of sight and data relay services for spacecraft in cislunar space, which also includes low Earth orbit. The secure network is made up of Nova Control, which we're keeping our eyes on right now, and strategically placed ground stations spread across the globe. The ground stations are expected to provide near continuous communications with Nova C during the entire IM-1 mission. With that entire network available, our flight controllers responsible for communications and ground stations will be the first people in Nova Control to start seeing data from our lunar lander, which means the ground station assigned to this part of the mission has locked onto Odysseus's signal. Now from the lander, to Nova Control, all of these innovations and capabilities are being put to the test right now as we prepare to enter our nominal acquisition of signal window with Nova C. Right now, we are listening into the mission audio loop and looking live Everybody into Nova Control. SpaceX just deliver us the OPM file. Okay, copy. You're good to process in the background while we work contact. Okay, I'll work with Fido on this. Right now, we estimate that the lunar lander is traveling about 10 kilometers per second, which is about 24,600 miles All right, I want to make sure Com's happy with it. Com? Uh, standing by. Um, I, I don't see packets updating in packet counts, unless I'm looking in the wrong spot. 
um, and I'm not seeing anything populate in AOS. So we're still standing by for autonomous commissioning and making that first ground communications from the lunar lander in space. We expect the carrier lock call to come from the comm or ground network stations inside of Nova Control. And this is Houston's first commanded lunar mission since Apollo 17. All right, I see packets. And I see. All right, guys. And, then, and there we have it. We have packets. That is Michaela Landavar All right, guys. on the ground. Tom, I want your report. Uplink and downlink, what do we got? Okay, so um, I am seeing packets populate on the AOS screen and in the packet counts area. Looks like telemetry is coming in pretty well. Um, we have not started uplink, so we do not have uplink locks at this point. But it looks like um, we are seeing most everything that we would expect um, as far as That's an excellent concerned. call. Um, we have okay. reached a pivotal milestone. We're going to bring it back into um, the broadcast booth and congratulate the team working inside of Nova Control as our Nova Sea lunar lander has successfully separated from the second stage of the launch vehicle, autonomously commissioned, and made first communications contact with Nova Control. What an achievement for the entire Intuitive Machines team. Let's honor this momentous milestone and prepare for the challenges and triumphs that await us on our lunar journey. From Intuitive Machines' Nova Control in Houston, Texas, thank you for joining our portion of the IM-1 mission broadcast. We'll toss it back over to Megan in Florida for reaction to the successful launch of our IM mission. Megan. Yeah, from here at NASA, we just want to say congrats to Josh and Intuitive Machines, another successful CLIPS launch and orbital insertion of a commercial lunar lander. Now, hopes are high uh, that uh, a U.S. commercial lunar lander will make it to the moon. And joining me now to talk a little bit more about that and this program is Chris Culbert, and he is the CLIPS program manager. Exciting to see this unfold right in front of us, huh? Yeah, this is great. Uh, SpaceX gave him a wonderful ride, great launch, uh, really Clear sky, we can see it all the way up to the, up, up to the well, not to the moon, but on the way. Um, <laughs> we but saw the moon in the distance. We, we saw it, we can see the moon. It was, it was a great launch, this is a great step. It's a lot of hard work to get here. This is five years of effort from a very small company. Um, but they've made a lot of progress, they solved a lot of problems, and now they're on their way. Um, so this is a good start, but it isn't the end yet. They yeah. got to they got to finish the next step. That's right. <laughs> but at least we we have eight days, right? We, we do. have eight days. Yeah. So they've got six days to get to the moon, and then we'll then we'll then we'll hit the hard step. Yeah. So with the challenge of landing on the lunar surface, what's your message to the intuitive mission? So the big thing right now, um, they need to stay focused. Um, space is hard. S small mistakes can doom you. Um, we know they're very talented. They're very well organized. We're really impressed with the te the depth and technical skills of this team. But you have to stay focused. You got to make sure you nail everything and stick the landing. So again, a lot to look forward to, but we're, we're optimistic. Yes, we are. We're looking forward to it. I got a lot of faith in these guys. Great. Chris, thank you so much. Glad to be here with you uh, again for another Clips launch. Thank you very much. Okay, so that is going to wrap up NASA Intuitive Machines and SpaceX coverage of the launch of the Nova Sea Moon Lander on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Pad 39A here at Kennedy Space Center. Again, if all goes well, Nova Sea is expected to land on the moon eight days from now, so mark your calendars, on February 22nd. It would be the first U.S. landing on the moon since 1972. We'll, of course, bring you that coverage live right here on NASA TV. And until then, you can find out more uh, about this mission and other NASA CLIPS launches by going to the link we're about to show on the screen here, nasa.gov slash CLIPS. We're going to leave you now with a replay of today's launch. For everyone here at NASA Intuitive Machines and SpaceX, I'm Megan Cruz, and have a great morning. 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff. Go SpaceX, go IM-1, and the Odysseus Lunar Lander. Vehicle pitching down range. Stage one propulsion is nominal.
successfully lifted off from pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center carrying the IM-1 payload. Now during ascent, we tilt the engines, the technical no, term being gimbling, and that turns the rocket horizontally. And we're